Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just give it a minute. We'll let everybody get in. Okay, let's kick off. Um, so thank you to those people who are joining for the third session today. And I'm sorry, we'll just do a quick intro um, for those people that are joining for the first time. My name is Shannon Ganem, and I'm the Global Education Director at Magnum Photos. And with my colleague, Pauline Vermeer, Cultural Director at Magnum Photos New York, we are your hosts, uh, hosts for the Beyond Magnum Talks program. Beyond Magnum is an in-depth a talks program created to address and explore some of the challenges facing the photographic industry today. If you missed our launch event, I would encourage you to visit the Beyond Magnum page on the Magnum website, where you can hear from our president, Olivia Arthur, about the genesis and aims of the program. We also have yesterday's incredible conversation with uh, Simchi Yin and Wayne Modest, and recordings will be added there after each event now. A little bit of housekeeping, uh, you will be able to participate via the Q&A box. Um, please put in any comments and questions and we will endeavor to get to as many as we can. If we don't answer your question, uh, we're collating these and hopefully we will hear some of that in the reflection at the end of this chapter um, and certainly at the end of the series. We recognize that this series of events will likely raise more questions than answer, that's actually the point. Um, and it's the beginning of a conversation. So thank you for your contributions to that dialogue. Please do share anything, any thoughts with us. It would be incredibly helpful. Um, we will, we have so many fantastic speakers in this program. We would not, we'd spend all of our time reading their bios, um, their extensive, incredible bios. So please uh, have a look at the Beyond Magnum page. You'll see the full uh, full write up there and sometimes we might just have to do a, a brief introduction, we want to get to the conversation as quickly as we can for you. Um, please also note that the full chapter two program is now online and that starts next Wednesday um, on the topic of representation, so we can't wait um, looking forward to that one we will tell you a little bit more about that at the end. And with that i'll hand over um, and invite. Um, our co-chairs of this chapter, Azu Wobogu and Azia Yagmurian, uh, to frame our discussion and introduce our speakers. Hi, Azu and Azia, how are you? Hi, Shannon. Hi, again. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you. So, our last talk of the first chapter, uh, our last study case, is co called Working with Archives, Past, Present, Future. Let me introduce to you our speakers, Christina Demidel and Rafael Milach. And we'll also have Moritz Neumüller joining us for the discussion after presentation by Christina and Rafael. So uh, I would like to read the short bios, just very short ones. <laughs> Christina Demidel investigates photography's ambiguous relationship to truth. Blending documentary and conceptual photographic practices, she plays with reconstructions and archetypes in order to build a more layered understanding of the subjects she approaches. Working from a premise that mass media is reducing our real understanding of the world we live in, Demidel responds to an urgency to reimagine tired aesthetic tropes and insert opinion in place of facts. Her impulse for unconventional angle developed after a 10 year career as a photojournalist, when Demidel stepped outside of straight documentary art and, produ and produced the acclaimed series, The Afronauts in 2012. It explored the history of a failed space program in Zambia 
in the 1960s through staged reenactments of obscure narratives challenging the traditional depiction of the African continent. Rafael Milach's work, Rafael Milach's work explores themes of history and transformation, particularly with the former Soviet bloc, using a myriad of mediums such as photography, conceptual art, books, video, and curation. Though he initially tackled subjects through a traditional documentary perspective, his later projects draw on a more conceptual approach. Milach was born in 1978 in Poland and grew up during the collapse of the Soviet bloc. He studied graphic design at the Academy of Fine Arts in Katowice, Poland, before falling in love with photography the first time he picked up a camera. He later studied at the IFT Institute of Creative Photography of the Silesian University in Opava, Czech Republic, where he is currently a lecturer. Moritz Neumüller is a curator, educator, and writer in a field of photography and new media. He has worked in research and management positions for international institutions, such as the Museum of Modern Art in New York, La Fabrica in Madrid, and Photo Island in Dublin. He is currently chief curator of the photo book Week Arus Denmark. Since 2010, he runs the Curatorship, a platform that provides useful information for visual artists. At the same time, he started the project Arte Contacto to improve the access to arts and culture. From 2016 till 2019, Neumüller was the communication manager of the award-winning EU project Arches. So, in today's talk, Christina de Midel and Rafael Mila will expose their artistic strategies when working with, in, from, on, and about archival material. They both have worked intensively with archives over the years, sometimes as an inspiration and source for their own creation, sometimes as the destination of their artistic production. Christina and Rafael belong to a new generation of image makers that is very much aware of the fine line that separates the private from the public in the age of social media and visual self-representation. And, the, and they use this open border to their advantage. So I'll pass the mic to Christina. Welcome. Hi, Zia, welcome to you too. And thank you for the introduction and for the reminder. And so I, I remember uh, who I am <laughs> and what I'm supposed to say. I always love that. <laughs> well, um, I, I'm really happy to be part of this, of this panel uh, for what it means for Magnum and for what it means for photography. And I thank you very much for the opportunity uh, that you're giving me to, to just share three examples of uh, what this panel is about, that is a working with archive, past, present and future. So I selected three bodies of work that to me have a special link and respond in a way to what archive, uh, the link of archive with the past, the link uh, uh, between the archive and the present and with the future. So uh, the first one is, uh, is, uh, is, is the Afronauts. Uh, it's a well-known series um, and it has many more layers. It's not only archive because it talks about tragedies, it talks about expectation, and it also talks about representation and, and who has been representing what, and we all know it's uh, white people. And I mean, there's a long history, but the, the debate is not, and the panel is not about that this time. So I, I just wanted to, well, a small, small, um, presentation of the Afronauts. Uh, it's, it's a real story. It's something that really happened in 1964, but that the media just presented very briefly with a few examples that were sort of mocking um, the initiative and that were was putting actually again any African um, uh, initiative into, well, turning it into something impossible and, and so on. So, uh, this is one of the aspects that uh, struck me uh, harder when, when I learned about the, the story because my first introduction to the story was actually a, a link that I found on YouTube and it was an interview that uh, BBC, if I'm not wrong, or AP correspondent was doing to Edward Makuka and Coloso, who was a leader of the Zambian space program. 
And he was really using the, the platform of an interview to make fun of him. And, and I, I found it so offensive. Uh, and I realized like, wow, this is actually interesting information. It would help uh, not only understand better the continent, but also uh, understand better what ourselves, no? what we expect, et cetera. I mean, there is many layers and very little time. But uh, in this case, this is, I just created archive. I, I just made um, sort of fictional looking images to represent and to record uh, and to keep a record of something that really happened in the past. So it looks um, like imaginary, it doesn't look real, it doesn't use the, the language of documentary photography, but uh, it's really documenting or illustrating in a plausible way something that happened in the past. That is just for people to, to invite people to go and check and draw their own conclusions uh, using one of the, the hooks of photography. Like uh, we all love beautiful images. So if you create a beautiful image, people will eventually want to know more about it, hopefully. Um, so this is about archive and past. There is a lot of, uh, of hints uh, around how Africa has been represented, like pregnant women, how women are normally represented, how soldiers are normally represented, the general attitude of African people when they are photographed and how they are photographed. There is like, we could have 100 panels <laughs> about it, but it, today is not the day. Um, so this is how uh, I am just creating archive creating an archive that was not there, that should have been there. But of course, I'm not creating it from a neutral point of view. First, because I'm white. Second, because I've never been to Zambia and I've never been, uh, I don't really know all the details. So I just create a set of images that um, acknowledge or that makes visible the lack of archive. So there is not enough information about that event, why? And why, I mean, it's really why wasn't this uh, uh, archive because there was no information and no reporting from, from the facts. Uh, the next one, uh, I know I just have like 10, 20 minutes, 10, 15 minutes is party. And it's, it's about uh, the present, the relation between archive and the present. And it's actually, I mean, this is more like, <laughs> funny in a way, it has a more funny approach than by far the Afronauts. And it's just, it just comes from the, from the, from the acknowledgement or realization uh, after spending quite some time in China, like six months. And I was in a special moment of my life where I was sort of rediscovering um, photography for myself right after leaving photojournalism. And, and really I was sort of numb. I was not really analyzing, no wanting to report anything, just being there with the camera and reacting to that. And when I finished, I realized that um, uh, China is officially a communist country. So it, there's only one party, it's the communist party. Uh, there's no elections, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if there's elections, it's not the ones that make a change. And so it's officially and seen from outside uh, um, a communist country. But when you are there, you actually see that there is many more things that are related to liberal um, understanding of life and economy than to communist regime. So still, uh, the, the, the official version is out there. And it's the one that is like needs to be um, respected that's the law so when i left china uh, the only big conclusion i had was that uh, okay china is a uh, communist officially but it's not really communist so i wanted to talk about that which is a very vague generic and, and i mean big idea um, and i just took the, the the like the iconic thing of communism the thing that every communist chinese every chinese person should relate to and it's a little red book by mao and on the first page if you go back a couple of slides or maybe just one slide so this is actually the first page it says uh, the title was the communist party uh, and to me, because I'm not an English native, party always comes with two meanings. <laughs> it's a political party, but also the party we mostly prefer. So I just decided to play really like a crosswords um, using also a very uh, Chinese <laughs> uh, technique that is censorship uh, to direct or to update a very valid, a still valid and an official document 
uh, which is something that then, I mean, other people have done. I'm not inventing dynamite or anything like that, but I was using that, that um, uh, technique of censoring, but also whiting out and, and just directing and reinterpreting uh, an official document just to make it fit to the reality of China now. So it's a sort of update, uh, just like when you update your apps in the computer, but this is an historical book or an official book update. And the version is of course also updated uh, with different photographs and new imagery that is linked to these new political premises. So it's no longer propaganda, it's no longer Mao and the people in the fields, it's no longer this um, imagery that talks about how good everything is. It's more, it's, it's like a different and eventually more fresh um, link between text and image. So the book, I mean, it's called uh, The Party. It's called Party and it's a facsimile edition of The Little Red Book by Mao. It's a series that works for me better in the book. So you can pull the slides, but it's actually how you can use um, archive, like something archival, not necessarily imagery, but uh, a product of history that has not been updated and that creates a very illogical coexistence of realities and just evidence that crazy coexistence and evidence it without being you know critical or diminishing in any way just like okay this is happening together how is that possible so it's this questioning of archive when you put it in reality, in the present context? Is it still valid? Is it still useful? What, how can we read it now? Because we need to update our way of reading this text because context has changed, which is so important when we read archive, like context. Without context, there's nothing, we're lost. And to finish, uh, hopefully still on time, uh, I want to talk uh, with the Gentleman's Club uh, about the future of archive. Um, like now that we have a much better understanding that because we have this time perspective of um, what archive can do and what is the responsibility of archive and, and, and so on, because archive, I guess, we, we have the perspective and the full understanding now that we have some material to understand. But maybe 100 years ago, there was no real archive. We and no people really looking at it. So thinking that way, I also worry about what the archive will be in the future. Like what are we doing now that we will we'll allow the people who study us through the images we leave behind, how are they going to understand the, the, work, the world we live in now and how will they fully understand all the layers and nuances there are? So one of the subjects and the topics that I've always been uh, worried about is a representation of women, of course, and inside this big topic of representation of women and photography that is huge, I especially worry about the representation of um, sexual workers. So if you type Google, that will be the future and is already like our visual library. You go to Google images and type prostitution or sex work, um, like probably 99.99% of the images you will get are images of women naked in dirty rooms or somewhere, but it's mainly women. You never, you see them, you see the, 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 the sexual workers, but you never see the client. So uh, even if there is uh, so many images and so many images uploaded and we are invaded by uh, avalanches of images, still one of the most romantic topics for photography and for reportage and for journalism that is always uh, popular, that is uh, prostitution. Like there's so many photographers who go to Kolkata, who go there to take the pictures of the brothers of the Red District, or, you know, all these, they only show the woman. How is it possible that we're missing the other half of the business or a very important part of the business. So I, with that idea, thinking of the archive of the future, I created this series that started more like an experiment in Rio de Janeiro. I just put an ad in a newspaper uh, in the same places where the girls advertise their services, asking for prostitute clients to pose for me in, ex in exchange of money. I thought nobody would reply, but Brazil is such an amazing country that actually <laughs> plenty of people replied. So it kickstarted the project and, and well, I basically go in the same rooms that they would go with the, with the sexual workers 
and pay for their time, pay for the room, pay for their time, and also pay for a bit of information that I think is useful for the feminine audience. Because uh, we, uh, men can very easily uh, get information about how the thing works. They can ask their friends, father, family, cousin, whatever. But women, uh, we cannot ask our husbands, we cannot ask our friends because it's taboo just for women. So we are missing a big <laughs> part of information. And this is maybe a project created for the future for everyone, but now it's created for the feminine audience. So at least we understand how it happens, how it goes, and we maybe start uh, unbuilding the taboo and, and understanding this as something normal or not, but we cannot judge it without uh, having all the information. So until now I have done 70 um, clients in different cities, not only Rio, but also Lagos, Mexico City, Bangkok, Paris, um, I, there's more places, but ah, La Habana, <laughs> and I still need to do a couple more places like LA, and I'm choosing all the all the cities that have a special romantic link with uh, sexual work. Uh, LA is for pretty women that we are very happy that Julia Roberts was a sexual worker, and and so on. So I also try to reflect on the differences between each city. For example, this is in Bangkok. And of course, there is a lot of locals that were willing to pose for me, but I really wanted uh, white people and tourists uh, because Bangkok is well known for its, its sexual tourism. So it's difficult, more difficult in these places, but doable. And I can shut up now. <laughs> I think I said everything I had to say in my 10, 15 minutes. So um, yes, I hope I've, I will finish this project uh, very soon, as soon as the pandemic allows me to travel a little bit more again. And Asia, you can go back. <laughs> wow. Wow, Chris, thank you so much. That was brilliant. We have a lot of questions and we're going to get into it after Rafa's talk. So Rafa, over to you. Mike is yours. The floor is yours. Okay. Hello. hello. Um, let me share the screen. Yeah. Okay, can you can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go okay. on. So, start Rafa, could you just switch your video on? Um okay. There you are. Oh, Great. Hello. I, oh, I can see myself. That's horrible. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. I have to go back. No, no, no. Okay, that's me. Um, my name is Rafa Milak. Thank you, Acer, for introduction and um, thank you for inviting me for, for this panel. And um, <clears throat> um, I'm going to speak for uh, from uh, my very much local perspective uh, about uh, the place that I grew up and I come from. I was born. So that authorizes me, in a way, to uh, to tell stories from 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 this place, and I'd like to speak about um, um, a different usage of archive um, in uh, in the context of politics and um, and activism, as these are the main areas of my uh, of my interest and my activity uh, with uh, with photography. So. It's like for more than a decade now, I've been trying to investigate a space of um, intersection of visual arts and politics, which is a tricky and unsexy area. Um, uh, but still, I've been uh, in that space for, um, uh, for, 10, for, for 10 years now. And since my work has been dealing with uh, propaganda and um, uh, propaganda of the authoritarian regimes and hybrid democracies, uh, of the former East Bloc and the post-Soviet uh, post-Soviet region, I've been trying to deconstruct certain systemic uh, oppressive behaviors with the tools that I have, which is photography uh, mostly. And um, uh, once in a while, I engage um, archives in um, in this process. Um, so I, I, I'm going to briefly introduce like uh, three different strategies uh, of using the archives from. Um, Appropriation to from uh, to, through uh, certain classical artistic gestures to activism actually. Um, so the first um, the first one is related to propaganda catalogs um, published, uh, which is called the President, and um, um, and it's 
And it's uh, related to the um, institution called Haider Lee Centers and uh, a cultural and historical memorials building the cult of the first president of the post-Soviet Azerbaijan, which is a, in fact, authoritarian um, um, country, which is uh, currently ruled by, by the son of uh, Haider Aliyev, uh, Ilham Aliyev. And uh, the catalogs uh, uh, that I found in those uh, centers, these propaganda catalogs, advertised various activities uh, that the president was taking part in, like visiting hospitals, um, uh, visiting some uh, uh, sports centers, um, uh, or opening the factory lines and so on and so on. Um, and what attracted my attention was uh, a presidential hand pressing various buttons, uh, which is an obvious gesture of power and control. Uh, so I appropriated the images from this uh, propaganda catalogs and I radically cropped them, um, depriving them from their uh, original context um, and uh, building a, in my view, a uh, relevant metaphor of, uh, uh, of the oppressive authoritarian regime that I was dealing with. So um, additionally, uh, that was a time of uh, nuclear tensions between the US and the North Korea. So more uh, global context could be loaded in this, within this small uh, typology of posters uh, that, I, uh, that I produced in the end, like this uh, scaled uh, big uh, presidential hands pressing different, different buttons. Um, Another story uh, that, um, um, another example of working with archives, um, in my case, uh, within the political context um, is a project that reflects uh, certain systemic oppression, uh, civic engagement, and uh, how the contemporary context actually influences our daily life. And um, it was actually my, my, my first visual comment about uh, growing social unrest and the protest, uh, uh, protest culture. Uh, after the right-wing populist uh, 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 government took over the power uh, in Poland back in 2015. I don't know if I mentioned that I'm based in Poland. Did I? I, I think I have. Um, so the series of colleges, um, uh, which is called the First March of Gentlemen, they create a fictitious narrative um, where I relocated people from, um, uh, from the private archive of a local Polish photographer uh, into the protest formation. So a certain public event. So personal have, uh, has become uh, public. Um, I mean, I forced that process. Um, and that was my kind of wishful thinking and the metaphor of, uh, uh, of a Polish uh, civic society that we, in my view, are largely missing and, um, and uh, the society that resists and the response to the political decisions despite of uh, certain uh, uh, potential pacification or, uh, or, or violence uh, related to the resistance. So in this project, I um, applied certain um, artistic strategy, uh, a, a little bit abstract, uh, uh, collaging the, um, uh, the, the, the images. Um, to express my concern about, uh, um, about a contemporary uh, political situation. And, um, and the last, uh, last uh, project I wanted, to project, it's not even a project, but last uh, example of, uh, of uh, my um, understanding of uh, work with uh, archives is much more, much more literal, uh, visual-wise. And it's uh, it's called the Archive of Public Protest, and um, and uh, it's um, it's a collaborative platform um, 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 that uh, photographers from all over Poland, engaged photographers from all over Poland, are uh, taking our create create this this platform that I initiated in 2019, and um, it's uh, the platform collects uh, the images of protests that that we are. Uh, uh, that we are um, um, facing uh, currently in Poland. And, and this archive is quite specific. It's a kind of a new archive and it's growing. It's immensely growing recently. And it's, um, it's, it, it's been created to visually support and um, uh, build uh, a representation of protests 
uh, of uh, LGBTQ plus uh, communities or uh, of uh, women's uh, women's um, women's rights movements, political refugees or uh, climate change related uh, topics. So the archive visually contributes to the ongoing critical discourse about uh, about discrimination, violation of uh, of, uh, of human rights, and um, and um, and or, or a climate change. Uh, so it's a semi-open um, archive, uh, uh, which is uh, very much performative, and it's it uh, it's very much dependent on the energy of the and intensity of the of the of the of the of the protests, and it reacts uh, differently uh, depending on the in, on the situation. And the idea uh, um, behind making this archive. Uh, was to make to make it uh, to make it alive to to perform this archive and one of the ways to perform it uh, was uh, the uh, the idea of going back to the streets with a picture section. So uh, we decided to launch a spontaneous publication, which is called a strike newspaper, uh, which uh, consists of uh, uh, pictures of protests that we are taking and. Uh, along uh, um, along the uh, uh, the protest uh, the, the slogans that the protesters actually bring to the streets. So we print a newspaper that can be used as a um, as a banner as a poster. So the protesters can actually use uh, the newspapers uh, uh, um, because they are distributed at, at the protests. So. Um, um, we kind of visually contribute to the protests, uh, coming back with the pictures that we actually took at the protests. So this is uh, this is how pe people actually uh, use the newspapers. And uh, so far, we've uh, we've published uh, like the four issues of this um, of this publication. Um, uh, two uh, two first issues were dedicated to the women's strikes. Uh, 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 against uh, the restrictive uh, abortion law that was recently introduced in Poland. And uh, we also uh, uh, did one issue dedicated to the climate change. And just literally a few days ago, we, uh, we, we, we released uh, an LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus issue dedicated to uh, uh, to this community, uh, which is beautifully contributing to the Pride Month that we are actually celebrating in June. Um, we are currently working on the next issue that will be dedicated to uh, Belarusian revolution and the political repressions. Um, so this is uh, this is the issue to come, and this is that what you can see at the at, um, um, on the screen is uh, how people. Uh, uh, Use this newspaper, so it can function on very much on, on on various on various layers. It can be used uh, like photography. Uh, with this uh, experimental archive, is kind of going out of the this photography or art bubble, and it really contributes to certain serious uh, political discourse that we are visually supporting. Oh, uh, sorry, I tried to. Load a lot of information, and um, I tried to hurry because I knew that we we don't have that much time. But that will be uh, that will be it. Thank you. Stop sharing, man. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Um, uh, Moritz, over to you to moderate the panel now. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, Moritz. And afterward, we will come back as and I to. Um, wrap things up. Uh, Moritz no more there. Thank you very much. Wonderful. That was quick uh, ride um, uh, through a lot of projects. And um, maybe we, we start directly with Rafael because I can see him here on the screen. And then, Christina, maybe you want to also uh, come back with your microphone. And here you are and your video. Wonderful. So. Um, I still uh, doesn't really matter because we have to start somewhere and we just start with what we uh, what we heard from Rafael and then we'll go back to uh, Christina's work. So apart from I mean it was fascinating uh, to see how uh, you use um, the archive not only as uh, Asya has uh, well said in the beginning not only as a source but also as a destination of your work right so that, that was very clear and um, I was wondering 
Um, so if we think about um, Alan Sekula's um, notion that, uh, or theory, um, quite um, interesting theory that the, um, an archive or the structure of archives uh, come very much in photographic archives, of course, come very much from the, from the police archives no, of the 18th, 19th, uh, not 18th, on a 19th century and 20th century. And, um, and uh, maybe a bit um, citing probably Foucault, who uh, also said that an archive, and it's the, um, the uh, how you store and how you use information can never be innocent, right? So archives are always done for something. Yes, to preserve something for the future, but what do you preserve? What do you leave out? How do you store it? How do you use the material? Who do you let in? Who can use this material? Who is it for, right? So this is especially, I think, interesting in this, um, yeah, in this tension that you created between these historical archives going back to 1901, this, uh, this uh, children's revolution um, no, in, in one of your books. And, uh, and then uh, in the fifties from that um, archive of the local uh, photographer, I probably pronounce him wrong, but uh, something like Richard Sepanyak or something like this. <laughs> and um, uh, these pictures of these young men you know, showing this very um, interesting poses and so on, and then uh, um, combining these two. And then of course, also in the political range and um, uh, yeah, with political, let's say purposes, probably your, uh, this la last archive that you're creating with, um, I understand with a, with a number of other people, right? So um, maybe that was not a question, so I'll try to formulate one. Um, do you see that, uh, do you see this tension? And uh, uh, what is, um, is there any uh, red thread when you, uh, work from an archive and into an archive? Well, uh, actually everything is an, uh, is an archive or a certain resource that we can use or reuse, recontextualize, we can put, uh, we can, and it recont recontextualizes itself. Uh, so, uh, I mean, our task as uh, creators or people who take care of the uh, archives is to be kind of cautious and, um, and uh, you know we have to we have to be uh, aware that the context is con constantly changing, and it's like I I mean the like working with archives is just like working with photography. It's like it's just a tool uh, that uh, might be useful to communicate certain uh, problems, and it's uh, I don't like I, I wouldn't like to fetishize the the archive as uh, as a, a, as, a, as a practice. I mean, I like working with archives. There's a lot of uh, traps and, um, and, 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 you know, uh, blind, uh, blind alleys with, um, when you work uh, with, uh, with archives, uh, when you don't look around carefully and, you know, how do you use certain images? Uh, 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 you know, how do you relocate certain situations from, uh, from one place to another, and uh, you know, and this, this, the, the context uh, uh, can radically change, and it could be, uh, you know, uh, harming for, uh, you know, for people that are represented in the archive, and so we have to be aware about that because it, our entire practice, not only working with archives, uh, is, uh, you know, related with certain responsibility, as um, because you know, uh, uh, we take pictures of people in certain situations, so. Uh, what you uh, what you commented about uh, you know who can see who can approach and who sees and creates uh, the archive the context uh, it's very crucial for this uh, for this uh, uh, practice in my view so um, the archive can be you know when you mentioned you know uh, uh, the archive as a certain uh, uh, you know institutional strategy which uh, can be also uh, a tool of oppression uh, we can kind of mirror that and we can, um, uh, we as creators uh, or we as uh, people who would like to, I, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, who would like to resist uh, the suppression, we can uh, use uh, various subversive strategies to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to bounce back from this uh, 
uh, creepy context of uh, of uh, various of various uh, archives. So it can be a powerful uh, powerful tool. And if you ask me if I deliberately uh, uh, had certain uh, agenda of uh, incorporating uh, archives in my practice, I would say no. I it's like uh, I mean I always try to I mean. Whenever I try to conceptual uh, conceptualize something really strongly, it falls apart. And you know, it's like I I let myself surprise with what I find. You know, it was a case of the Azerbaijani propaganda catalogs that I just accidentally uh, came across, and I thought, wow, the, all the pictures that I took in Azerbaijan was kind of not that strong. I mean, it, they were kind of uh, fitting the project that I was working on, but I thought like, yeah, I had I, I had I had this gift and uh, um, this uh, found uh, found footage that I, I can subversively use to criticize the regime, and um, and uh, you know the archive of Richard Stepaniak, this Polish photographer, uh, was also kind of an accidental find, and uh, I um, it was not something that was uh, that I planned in advance, uh, so it. You know, it's a kind of very spontaneous reaction on what you find on your way, and ultimately, the archive of public protest, which is such a spontaneous and uncontrolled morphing structure, uh, which is so dependent on on the external context, this political context of Poland, because it's happening in in, um, in Poland, but it I, I believe it's. Uh, communicate about certain issues that are uh, of a global meaning as well. Uh, uh, it's uh, so unpredictable and it's uh, when I think about the future of this of this archive, I think it, it will be perceived totally in a different way than what we do with this archive today within the protests and when the protests are gone i mean or they more they're more, more more quiet so it changes uh, dramatically yeah, thank you very much uh, of course i was born in the country of freud so i don't believe in these accidents and, and in your non strategy and christina lives in a country where there's also no accidents but just destiny uh, for many people so um, but we take your word for it um, it finds you and then you do something with it and, um, and I, I do see like a red line, a thread through your you know, work with archive, uh, also using books. And maybe uh, this would lead me to uh, Christina, who is also like yourself, a great bookmaker. And, um, and uh, Christina said that uh, she, uh, well, about, uh, maybe I can start with the last project, right? Uh, when you talked about uh, how people find images um, Nowadays is on the internet via a search engine, and uh, no certain subjects come up by keywords, of course, because we don't type or very little do we search by images, no, even if it's possible. But uh, normally we we use language to trigger information from archives, and that's one of the um, many um, problems with the digitalization of archives, right? That they not only use their kind of spatial uh, um, how would you say, uh, special relations no, between the objects. So to put two books next to each other, like in a library, means a lot. To put photographs on a stack here and not there uh, and together means something. Of course, in a digital archive, all this got, com gets mo normally completely lost. And the only way to retrieve information is by typing in the right word. And if the archivist has another way of seeing things, of seeing what is on this picture and what this picture is about. It could be man waiting on a bed and uh, has got nothing to do with the issue, right? So um, yeah, so it's uh, maybe the book form I was thinking while you were talking before, um, maybe the book form that you use for many of your projects, not all of them, but many, uh, is a way to put this back into place because in the book you can re-establish uh, not only picture-to-picture -picture relationships but also spatial relationships that um, get lost in these new uh, archives in the digital archives 
Would you uh, would you agree uh, with that? Uh, with this kind of theory um, that um, books um, can help you to work the archive back into a kind of um, yeah, into a state where there were much more meanings than just this text image relations. Yes, I think uh, totally. Not only books. I mean, books are like very refined products where you really can control many, many aspects of how the person who is uh, consuming your message, you can really direct him very much, him or her, <laughs> direct him very much. Um, but there is many other ways. You can have uh, slideshows, you can have hashtags, as you, as you mentioned, exhibitions. Uh, but it's really like a failed attempt. Uh, because then no matter what, even if you make a book, the image will exist by itself. And hen I mean, therefore, it's, it's like exposed to trillion different interpretations that will be uh, changing across time. And uh, so it's really an illusion to pretend that uh, one image is uniquely associated with one meaning, just like one word is never associated only to one meaning, like party, for example, <laughs> has two meanings. But Depending I think, on the context. Yeah, maybe, maybe I was trying to bring the water to the well. Uh, so I'll okay. try to reformulate. Show uh, me the way, the way to the well then. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's, um, of course, I did not, of course, this is true. Every image can be taken out of the context, both from a book as from an archive. No? But I was uh, thinking about um, this as one constellation, this book constellation, of course, can also be in an exhibition. No? If two, uh, in an architectural space, two pictures look at each other, you know, they start to talk. And if they are next to each other, no, we look at them in a certain way. So this is something, for example, we cannot do in a book. You cannot uh, make this spatial relationship, but you can make other relationships and propose meanings, which of course will never be the only meanings, but um, it's, it's a way of interpreting and re allocating and, and, and putting back the things in, in a certain way. That's what I meant, maybe. Yes, totally. I think that the book is uh, also historically and, and in photography, it's become like a very useful tool, especially for that, because it's like the original piece where the intention of the photographer and the content of the message is put in the right, not the right way, but the way it was intended, which doesn't mean it's the only way, as we all know, but it's like the you know like the seed of something that will grow but at least the intention is there and and it's easy at least to understand uh, it's easier to understand what the what the author is meaning is wanting to say um, and it's always good to have something that is uh, not only beautiful but also easy to catalog and uh, to keep as you know, like a cassette, like something, this is what this author wanted to say and he said it like this, then you lose control. Mm. After that, <laughs> you lose control, there's no way. In your party book, I remember I was uh, there with uh, Ramon, uh, or the editor, uh, we were printing, when we were printing the book and, um, and I remembered it was, you know, the materiality was so important in this reproduction, this facsimile, false facsimile, of course, of Mao's book. No, not only this plastic cover, but also this um, paper, no, this very um, thin paper that uh, they, uh, I think they used a cigarette rolling paper in the end. <laughs> for this. And so uh, the materiality, of course, is another aspect that gets lost when you uh, transition from a physical archive to a digital archive and this is um when we talk about archives in the you know, in the times like these it's not only the problems that we've said before words uh hashtags as you call them or tags no just mm -hmm. uh, tags within uh um, um an archive uh, structure or in the cataloging system of an archive stru structure together with categories no where do you put that so where do you put that um as we said before, it depends. You can uh, you can be much more uh, decisive and um, do this in a much more interesting way in a physical storage. But of course, we know that physical archives are disappearing. They are they are um, they are digitized and they are put online, which is great for researchers. But it's also um, yeah gives a lot of 
problems. And, um, and I think uh, part of the reasons why we're here is also because there have been problems um, for many archives, including the Magnum archive, of course. And um, maybe, um, yeah, the, we talked the other day about this um, private and uh, public aspects no, of what you consider your work, of what you keep for yourself, what you upload to a database. And uh, you said, if I remember correctly, that um, you two are part of a new generation who are much more uh, conscious of these um, problematics and uh, that you react in, uh, in different ways or you not you react, you act in different ways uh, when, um, let's say, playing ping pong with your archives, no? your personal archives, your work archives, your books, your, um, no? the things that you make public and the things that you keep private. Yes, I mean, I think one of the, the blessings of this visual era we are living now is that uh, many more people are have access to much more information, but it's also everything is much more exposed to criticism and to questioning that can be that is great and it's also the, the, the fuel for the engine to keep growing, but uh, it can also be misplaced and there can be you know like um, not good intentions <laughs> behind certain readings. Uh, for me, I think that when you say uh, Rafael and me and, and many others are a new generation eventually that takes in account all these future readings or the consequences or you know this photography has become much more layered, not only the practice, uh, we need to be much more careful, but also the viewer, the audience needs to be much more instructed. You cannot pretend to be naive now. You need to understand, just like, I don't know if uh, there's visual literacy, just like there was any other literacy. When we started reading, um, I don't know, to make a, a clear example is like, when you see an advertising of a shampoo and you see a woman almost having an orgasm when she washes her hair, you understand that that is advertising language. You don't pretend to think and you don't go to the supermarket, buy the shampoo and feel disappointed because you didn't have an orgasm washing your hair. That is already understood by us as a society. I would like to think that in the near future, the understanding and reading of visual imagery has also attached that level of context of intention and you know, not separating the small parts that help you build a very uh, specific and, and, and really <laughs> Uh, out of context uh, version of, of that image. And if that happens, I also hope that the audience to that message also understands that, that that's how it happened. Because, and, and, and I think in terms of that, and I will finish and leave, uh, let Ta Rafael talk very quickly. For me, it was very important when I started into, into the arts world and forgot about new, the newspaper and photojournalism, it all comes down to stop linking photography with truth. It can be true, but most of the time it's opinion and it can document something, but most of the time it's just perspective. So if we got rid of that truth stone that we carry all the time, maybe we wouldn't have to have these debates. So uh, Rafael, sorry, you can go now. I'm just, before I give it over to Rafael, I'm just uh, remembering that uh, a friend of mine um, who worked in the advertisement industry in South Africa, she's uh, writing now an art article for uh, a, a new book that I'm uh, doing about the uh, selling the white myth. So it's not only about having orgasms uh, when you uh, <laughs> wash your hair, it's also that you become clean and white, right? Yes. For many uh, <laughs> really centuries, uh, the Africans and other, uh, you know, other people uh, in other latitudes have been uh, shown that, uh, you know, that they can wash themselves white with certain cleaning products. And that's uh, another aspect, but uh, we don't have time for that one today because we are talking about the archive and about uh, the practice of um, Rafael and, um, and Christina. And so let's uh, uh, play the, ba the ball back to, uh, to Rafael, right? Um, so this, um, this aesthetics of, um, uh, of your own work, which is of course uh, based um, also in a bit, I would argue, let's see what you say, uh, in these um, photographs and books of the utopia of the life under socialism, no? when uh, the, the new architecture, the way of living, uh, the family, the work and so on were idealized 
in this um, kind of half propaganda, half art books uh, with uh, using the photographic language. Um, I think you, you're, you're nourishing your own practice together with uh, other um, um, photographers, I would say from, from your region. This is very much a source of inspiration also for your own work, right? You, you, you're using this a lot. Well, unfortunately, this is, this is where I come from. I mean, and I can't deny it. I mean, we have a quite rich uh, you know, tradition of uh, living with propaganda. I mean, someone who was born in a communist Poland, I mean, I was a teenager when uh, uh, the Iron Curtain collapsed. But uh, still, I, I, I remember that. And then um, it's, it's not that it changes overnight. It's, uh, it remains uh, within uh, the generation. Of course, it doesn't mean that the, you know, that the uh, propaganda is uh, strictly related to certain geography. It's like, <laughs> unfortunately, quite universal, but it plays different, uh, you know, different tunes in different, uh, in different places. And, um, and um, you know, to me, it's uh, it's been always a a resource of uh, an inspir like this dark inspiration. Uh, but it's uh, you know, uh, when I think about what I do, is you know, it's because I'm I'm afraid, I'm scared. You know, I sometimes I prefer to you know to be paranoid about something, certain processes and. You know, to uh, uh, to overreact sometimes, uh, rather than wake up when it's you know too late. Um, therefore, I I truly believe that we have this huge responsibility as uh, image makers, as, as artists, as citizens. You know, to to you know to prevent uh, cert I mean, prevent in our way because uh, you know I'm quite aware that you know the tool that we have is not a uh, it's not extremely, it can be persuasive and powerful, but it's, you know, only when it's combined in, uh, or when only when it exists in certain constellations and allies with uh, uh, various disciplines, uh, uh, you know, organizations, politics, uh, with, you know, activists, organizations, and uh, different movements, social movements. Um, so, um, uh, you know, just to uh, deliberately use this tool as a as something that could potentially, you know, prevent certain uh, uh, certain uh, processes processes to go to to too far. And and photography is uh, decodable. You know, it's uh, you know the environment that we grew up. You 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 asked about the, you know this new generation. I I mean, it's just a uh, it is generational thing because the environment that we've been growing in, it's a completely different one from, you know, someone who's been pr practicing photography like 40, uh, 40 years ago, uh, for instance, right? And um, so this is our kind of natural environment. And even for younger people, it's, you know, they, they probably are much less attached and they are much more conscious, I don't know, maybe, hopefully, uh, about this uh, digital environment and this, immediacy of um, and, uh, and the wide, uh, incredible spread of the images uh, via various internet platforms. So uh, that is a wonderful thing. That is also a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, um, at a certain point, probably we'll, um, we'll get some questions in from, from the public, but maybe we, uh, we have um, um, some few couple of more minutes um, to speak here. And uh, so Pauline, if you want to interrupt us and throw in some questions, you're, you're welcome. Oh, good. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, oh, and they have disappeared. I could see two. Shannon, did, did you see those questions? If you go to the answered ones, there's oh, an good. answer. Yeah. Yes, so should what I read the questions to you? Yeah, all? that would be great. Okay. Answer the questions. Sorry? Shannon already answered. No, she, no, no, she's saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm going to read the first one to you from Rahim Sekuti about Moritz's question to Christina: Shouldn't restacking internet media content to meet the intended meaning be a collaboration between the artist and people? If so, would you propose a way to arrange this? 
I'm I'm afraid I didn't fully grasp the question. Sorry, it was too. No, big. no, 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 no. I'll go. I'll go more slow. It is a complex question about uh -huh. yeah, yeah about Maurice's question to Christina. Shouldn't yeah. restacking internet media content to meet the intended meaning be a collaboration between the artist and people? If so, would you propose a way to arrange this? Okay, so it, it, this is a, a question about the um, no the interpretation. Uh, like the social contract of photography that we mentioned two days ago, right? Uh, this concept that it's not the artist or the photographer who makes the image, but it's the uh, the reading and everybody, you know, um, these different meanings that Christina has already talked about that make actually the image, right? If I understand that. And how, how, how could this be done, Christina? <laughs> that's, that's a oh, very different three. question. I yeah. wish I knew. If I knew how to do that, uh, um, I mean, <laughs> that would be, I don't know, I would be a genius. I think it's, there's a certain charm trying to, to archive the archive and to, you know, like project order into something uh, who is like naturally chaotic. It's, it's just frustrating from the beginning. I think there is, I don't know, I'm here I may sound a little bit, you know, like Buddhist or whatever you want to call it and to reading too much uh, wellness books, something like that. But I think we, we should stop uh, trying to define uh, and put order in things. This is a very white people thing, you know, like uh, archive and this is like this and this means that. And when we have something secure, we feel like, you know, like uh, life can go on. It's, it's fine. I mean, an image has a meaning in the beginning. It will have a thousand more and a million more before it disappears, if it ever disappears. So, and that's fine. We don't need to control these things. And of course there will be conflict. And of course there will be people who feel offended and people who feel like super happy with the image. And that's fine. The, 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 you know, the problem is that, that now before it used to be our family, our friends, our city, and now it's the world. And the reaction to your work and to any image can come from very different cultures, from, from many uh, cultural and, and educational levels even. Uh, because I don't know, if we go to very specifics, for example, uh, nudes or children who are not wearing clothes, for example, this is a very delicate, very, very extremely delicate subject and topic we need to be very careful about in certain parts of the world. But if you go to Amazonia, this is absolutely not a topic. <laughs> or if you go to certain parts of Africa or certain parts, I don't know, or wearing furs. Wearing furs is really a very hot and delicate topic. But if you go to the, um, to the North Pole, it's not. <laughs> so, it, I mean, this is very basic and I shouldn't even be saying that, but I think it would be interesting to, to somehow remind that to the audience because um, now many things are changing and, and all the weight of responsibility is put into the creators. Who you are, from where you're talking, you need to be careful with this, you cannot talk about that. Uh, you can, I mean, if I had to follow all the advice I, re I received from people online, I should just photograph white women in Spain. That's the only thing I can talk about. And I don't think that's fair because I have opinion on many other things <laughs> and I want to share it as opinion. Uh, but I would also like to share a part of a responsibility to the audience. They need to do their job. They need to understand the context. They need, they cannot just be, you know, like naive, like if they knew nothing about the world and then be offended by something that with the right context and the right research, very basic, would be something they can learn from. And that's it. I said it. <laughs> well, said it, uh, said it. Um, the only thing I have to add, I think, is not only the uh, geography, but it's also the time. No, so things were different in different times. What used to be um, uh, inoffensive, maybe in the '60s, now is um, completely different, right? Or in the '70s, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, people come from different parts of the world, and they interpret, of course, different things uh, differently, and they have the full right. But uh, maybe in this whole uh, internet discussion culture, we have uh, forgotten that the discussion is something that could also solve. And I mean, I'm now referring to your, um, to your um, 
what did you say, your Buddhist um, uh, <laughs> wellness, uh, mindfulness, well, mindfulness. That, uh, maybe that we uh, find answers together and not only use um, these new ways of communication to uh, throw stones at our heads, right? Hmm. There's always place for construction, but using the internet for destroying and for not opening, for closing doors, is it goes against the nature of internet. You have to open doors. Mm. Otherwise, can I add something on that? Uh, because I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but it was like about who is the creator and what is what kind of the social contract is, uh, uh, what kind of social contract we are uh, talking about, right? And it's, uh, I mean, it's. Uh, it's something which is very much involved with the different participatory projects these days, right? Like we give the voice to the communities and we are common creators because uh, I think like these days, uh, um, we particularly have to be careful about and we have to be knowledgeable about, uh, about photography and what kind of power do we have with bringing the camera to, to, to the place, to the communities, right? And we are uh, like photographers uh, are kind of uh, privileged and and you know in this power relation we are we are just stronger and we we create the narrative we can uh, uh, we can enforce certain narratives with uh, uh, with with the camera um, so like just to like being aware that this ultimate result of our uh, projects or possible projects can be a result of collaboration and uh, including the you know the voices and um, uh, of you know for instance the people that we photograph and it doesn't mean that we give uh, uh, we give the camera away and to uh, you know for, to, to someone to, to take the pictures it can be you know, one of the uh, strategies as well uh, but you know to think uh, about the different ways how uh, how can we like disbalance this already disbalanced situation photographer coming to certain place to certain community and um, I, I I think this is uh, this is something which is uh, pretty much uh, important these days and it also creates this idea of you know, solidarity and support in uh, in such a violent environment that we are functioning today so, so yeah sorry just wanted to add i i am just going to jump in and do a time check i'm just conscious of time i think we could this is incredible and i wish that we could keep going but i'm wanting to bring azu and azia in to help us wrap wrap up some of this thinking as well how okay. would you like Thank you, Shannon. That's great. Um, we certainly do not want uh, farmers photographing farmers and teachers photographing teachers and, and lecturers photographing lecturers. Far from it. We have, uh, we're concluding the, the case studies with uh, two image makers, um, Rafa and his activism and uh, politics in his work, and his postally um, beautiful representation of a uh, struggle in, in um, not just Poland, but in from previous communist countries. Um, and Christina um, has given us three timelines in her work. She, um, Chris has given us an exhumation of the past in the astronauts and the ability to revive a story that is suppressed or forgotten or deleted or de derided for whatever reason. And in part, Chris, Chris has given us um, stayed with the communist unresolved, um, unresolved obsession with censorship. And it's incredible how you're able to bring in something that does not change. Censorship has remained um, part of that culture. And you, you know, you're able to keep it playful and keep it interesting in a visually stimulating way. The alliteration and uh, the repetition and the recursive nature of the work in part is just able to arrest the moment. Um, and also the other aspect of photography that we haven't really been able to get into in this series is the captions. You know, when you have an image, the other aspect of, of, of photography is the caption. And the third and final aspect, the stool of photography, if you like, is publishing. We have a lot of publishing now. 
we have a lot of images now, but with Party, Chris is able to make us think about what redaction does in captioning and imagining the way we read images. And, um, and then we have the future archive, how we create artifacts for the future in the present time. And that is something that I think um, Raphael and Chris and um, Maurice were able to touch on. The work that we're all doing is creating artifacts for the future. And um, as I don't know if you have uh, uh, something to add, but I think um, we've been able to really touch on a bunch of these topics and uh, uh, I'd love for you to come in and you know, offer a few thoughts before we wrap up. Hello. Thank you, Azan. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about this paradox of um, just now while Azan was speaking about the linguistic construct, like how the, the, we talk about the archives and the first, and photographic archives, especially the first thing. Yeah, it's, just, it's all about the images. It's all about the visual culture, but how it's bounded between the linguistic art construct which created the structure of the archive and the second part of it, the publishing and how the image making is the one in between, like kind of to trying to find its way. So the panel is tilted somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. It's been a remarkably interesting and stimulating session. Um, back to you, Shannon, to and Pauline, to for the last words. Thank you. Great. Um, Azu and Azu, did you want to say anything anything broader than that about the other presentations, or um, we can and also we could let. Um, I'm not sure if Christina and Rafael needed to to go. Or we could. Was there anything else, Azia, that you want, and Azia, that you wanted to say about the the other presentations that we've seen? Um, I think using these case studies, we've been a, we've been able to touch on some of the most crucial aspects of building an archive, thinking about the archive and the present, resistance in the archive, distrust in the archive, and also most importantly, using all of that material not to be cynical, but to think about ways to construct future archives and to plug the gaps in the archive. And I love what Chris said about the audience also has a responsibility. You know, we, we the idea of snap judgments, reading an image because we see it quickly, we make a quick judgment, oh, this image is racist or this image is problematic. Context matters greatly. And the fact that publishing is the, the, the balance in representation and visual culture today is tilted in the favor, way too much in towards the towards publishing because we can all publish right now on our smartphones and share on social platforms, social, social media platforms. I think the audience also needs to have um, that responsibility. And that's why I really want to thank Magnum for these talks and for making it available online, free, and also for the idea to publish. Um, and produce an archive of the thoughts and the logic of what we've discussed. I think there have been diversity of ideas, diversity of thoughts. We haven't all agreed on everything, so that's really great. And um, I think that's a really great place to, to round off. I don't know if um, the other talks, by the way, are super interesting and I'll, I'll be tuning in. So um, if you're in the audience now, do tell your friends and um it do make the time i think it's really what um the moment thank you also i do not want to have the last word so shannon will give it back to shannon it's just that i saw there was another question on the in the chat and i think uh it has been half um responded now because it was about the agency of who gives us the right you know to to dig out images and give them a new context and i think uh, in part this is uh, really the audience itself and it's uh the audience's interest of to reinterpret these images in a new context. Um, right, of course, if all other things are legal, healthy, and uh, you know decent, I think it is the audience that um, that should uh, have part of this agency, and uh, it should not rest only on the 
on the shoulders of the artists, as, as you have said today, and uh, on, or on the archives and their uh, archivists themselves, but it's also, um, you know, everybody and, and together. But uh, yeah, that's, I think that could be a possible um, uh, answer to this question. Absolutely. I think that was, um, that was always the intention um, that we would, you know, what are the takeaways, um, particularly for us at Magnum, but clearly for everybody in the industry, what are the, um, how do we take this conversation forward? And that's one thing that has come out of this particular session that kind of pricked my ears up. I'm, I'm like, how clearly working in education, how, um, how, how does that work? You know, what is, and I love the fact, thank you, Azu, for, for mentioning um, the fact that this is a free program. We're so, you know, thrilled um, to have, to be able to offer all of this thinking. We're learning, we're hoping that our community is learning. Um, and, but yeah, there's something around that dialogue and how do we, how do we really continue um, to dig into how images are working? how images work in society. And so coming to um, the next chapter, starting next week on Wednesday around representation, and maybe Pauline might want to um, say a few words about some of the particular panels that you're looking forward to. We have representation and we have the future towards a future for, for photography. And I think we have Fred um, in the audience, um, Fred and Zara Rasul heading that one up. Um, so that's hopefully maybe where we might be able to um, answer some of these questions as well. Pauline, did you want to? Yeah, well, Asia, I wanted to ask Asia if you had something to say before also, because uh, we haven't heard you, but not necessary. Did you want to say something to close the chapter? Yeah. Hi, Pauline. Sorry, I had some technical issue here. Yes, I wanted um, to thank everyone who participated in this um, series of discussions and introduced their study cases to us. And um, we have tried to touch on so many important subjects. And what came out of it is just like that the answer for the future we probably might be looking in the past and like what I always think as a curator when I'm working with the archives and working with collections it's, it's sometimes bounded to not sometimes usually it's bounded to traveling to relocation to movement of myself to some place and what's the most important for me is to learn from the community to learn of their archiving practices. And probably those some communities don't even have those archiving practices. And maybe th this is the way how it should be. And I think we should also have the same approach when we think time-wise, right? When we sometimes are being critical to something which happened, is being represented now, but is a document of the time, the, the past, we are sometimes critical. Yes, we can be critical and we should be critical. But I think in some cases we should also accept that we should also learn from time. So thank you. Thank you well, thank you. That was a beautiful way to conclude and also to uh, introduce the chapter. The next chapter, chapter two, will be on representation and about community photography, about practices, about who, who can photograph whom, uh, how. And our two co-chairs will be um, Noel flores Tear, formerly Magnum Foundation, uh, now senior editor at the, at the New Yorker, and Anthony Lovera, who is himself a practitioner based in London and an educator. And I have a feeling that there will be many correspondences between what has been discussed in this chapter. And, you know, because of, of course, this is all in one, this is one big, big um, moment in photography that we are trying to dissect in three chapters. But of course, it's all about uh, ethics in photography. It's about accountability. It's about points of views and about what Christina is talking about to have the doors open and not closed. Um, so we are so grateful to you, Asia and Azu, for um, sharing this chapter, the opening chapter. You did this beautifully in depth. Um, 
and we are extremely grateful. And um, we also want to introduce, and that's the third chapter, Fred Richin with uh, Zara Rasul will be moderating um, the future of photography. Uh, and that will be the last, that will be the end of June. And we'll be talking about new ways to tell the story and also new ways to, um, to uh, curate, new ways to direct institutions. And yeah, looking forward to the next generations of practitioners. Um, and hopefully this will be, as Shannon says, we're raising questions. We can't answer many of them. In fact, we can't really answer, but at least we really wanted to raise those questions here with you all. And we think it's, uh, we, are, we are, Shannon and I and everybody at Magnum learning so much on the way. And we hope everybody here is as well. So thank you all and Moritz very much also for being here and in the last conversation. And, and I wish we were all here together, but yeah, hopefully soon all in person. Thank you all. Okay, thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you to everybody. Thank you all. And uh, thank you so much to, to everybody who has joined us. And yeah, so we'll hopefully see you again uh, starting next Wednesday. Um, and we'll be emailing out those details. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye.